right, welcome everybody to this week's episode of Life Imitating Movies uh, podcast with me and my buddy Mitch over there. We get together every week, pick some stories, discuss them. Except for this week, we're doing a little special because as of this airing, the Oscars are coming up this Sunday. So we're going to go ahead and discuss some of the uh, Oscar-nominated movies. But in order to kick it off this week, we're actually going to go through and pick our top 10 movies for 2020. And uh, I know it's a little late. We're in April going on May, but obviously award season this year was a little, uh, a little uh, delayed. All right. So my top 10 in order, starting with the trial of the Chicago seven soul tenant Promising Young Woman, Bad Boys for Life, The Trip to Greece, Hamilton, The Invisible Man, Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga, and last, The Father. So that is definitely a good top 10 list. And I'm sure since there was a scarcity of big or a lot of new movies last year, I'm sure ours will be a little bit similar, especially reflecting some of these Oscar picks that we screened for this episode. So without further ado, let me go into my top 10. Going from one to 10, we're going to start with The Invisible Man, Promising Young Woman, Nomad Land. Palm Springs, Onward, The Devil All the Time, Soul, His House, Impractical Jokers the Movie, and Wonder Woman 1984. So those are both of our top 10 lists for our favorite movies of 2020, the calendar year. So what we're going to do is just kind of highlight one of each of our lists to kind of talk about a little bit, just a pretty quickly before we get into the Oscars discussion, because obviously some of those movies are reflected in the Oscar nominations and potential winners. So Brad, what, what is your movie you kind of wanted to highlight out of your top 10 and just kind of have a quick discussion about? Uh, so out of all my, yeah, I mean, we have some Oscar winners in there that were Oscar nominees that we're going to talk about. So I actually went with one that I don't think you've heard of, which was The Trip to Greece, um, which was the fourth movie in a series of films that star Rob Brydon and Steve Coogan. If you know who, uh, I'm sure Steve Coogan you're familiar with, maybe Rob Brydon you might not be, but they're, they're improvised movies essentially. And it's just these two friends go on vacation the first one was just called the trip the second one was the trip to italy then the trip to spain then the trip to greece and uh these two guys just they go around these countries they eat they go to different restaurants eat the food uh and but they do these impressions like they're impressionists so they 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 do impressions of michael Caine, al pacino and stuff and they're just hilarious movies fully improvised by two great comedians yeah, it certainly sounds like an interesting series. And you're right. I'll be honest, before you had sent your kind of list to me for the top 10, I had no idea what this movie was. I, I assumed from the title that it was kind of a low key Oscar nominated movie sort of in that vein, although I didn't really see it nominated for much in terms of the Oscars. So, you know, tell people maybe just a little bit more kind of what the selling point is of this movie and why they should check it out. So essentially they, they, well, Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon in, in Europe are like, you know, big name people. And then obviously Steve Coogan got big in the States with uh, doing a lot of the uh, Ben Stiller type movies, you know, he's in Tropic Thunder and then Night at the Museum and stuff. And he was Oscar nominated a couple of years ago for Philo Philomena with uh, Judy Dench. And um, I mean, I, I, I like improv movies a lot because they just are, they're not scripted. It's like a Borat or something. They're, they're not, they, they are scripted, but they're loose form and stuff. And it's, it's really just, if you can appreciate a slow movie with two guys, just saying funny stuff, two funny guys having conversations. And then they break into like some of the best impressions you've ever heard. Like their Michael Caine is legendary. It's, it's like the best impression you've ever heard in your life. 
Well, it certainly sounds like an entertaining and an interesting watch. So, you know, perhaps someday soon I'll, I'll get to check this out and maybe some of the other ones, these other trip movies that have come before. So the movie I wanted to highlight out of my top 10 from the calendar year of 2020 is the movie The Devil All the Time. And this is one that people may not have heard of that much. Came out last year and it's a movie starring Tom Holland. It's actually a Netflix original. And if I had to describe it, I would say it's kind of like a dark drama. You know, there are things that happen and it's a sequence of events that leads to some pretty dark material or things happening in this small town in a rural area in, um, I believe it takes place in the 1950s, 40s, 50s, somewhere in that a little bit uh, kind of longer in the past ago. But it's certainly an interesting movie. And I said it stars Tom Holland, but it has a great cast to it. There are a ton more names in it that you should definitely look up because I don't want to, I don't even want to list them all right now because I know I'm going to forget somebody. But as somebody who likes this kind of genre of film, the things that kind of go on and again, how I would best descri- best describe it would be kind of a dark drama film. I really like this one, actually. It kind of caught me by surprise and I wouldn't call it the best movie of 2020 that I that I've seen, but it certainly made an impression on me. I have not heard of that movie. The Devil All the Time, is that what it was called? Yeah, it's a and... Nef- it's a Netflix original movie, The Devil All the Time. And I think you would like it because you kind of like these kind of, it's not dark and creepy. It's not kind of like that kind of dark, but it's, you know, uh, a brutal kind of sequence of events and things that people do in this small town in this rural area. I think you would really like it if you checked it out. So, you know, again, it's it's because it's a Netflix original. Sometimes those kind of fly under the radar. People might not know about them as much if it's not a big, buzzy Netflix movie that's due to come out or something that gets a major theatrical release. So clearly it kind of flew under the radar a little bit for some people. So I would definitely recommend checking it out if you have the time. Yeah, it definitely threw under the radar. If I haven't even heard of it, then yeah, I'd say, because I, not that I'm the end all be all, but if it's a movie I haven't heard of, it's because there was another one. I mean, not to switch, but you said so, a movie called His House. Yeah, His I've House. Never, I've never heard of that. His House was another one in the same vein. It was a Netflix original. This one was definitely a horror movie. So a couple of hidden gems on there for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to. I'll, when we finish recording i'll look them up to check them out but i like tom holland and does his house have any like stars in it or is that like a a low budget kind of horror movie i would say the latter um the names of the people starring in it because there are people who were kind of cast with the background of these refugees from another country and they're not exactly household names there are a couple recognizable faces in the movie but it's more just a small scale, very tightly made horror movie. So I would certainly check that out and devil all the time as well. All right. So to kick off the body of uh, this, this here episode, we're going to start with the screenplay categories, which are, you know, adapted screenplays, original screenplays. Um, This year there were some good, good nominees. I actually purchased a lot of the, uh, the screenplays off of eBay because, uh, the Writers Guild sends out, you know, their four-year considerations to the Writers Guild members, and then those people just put them up online to sell. So I, I end up buying a lot of them each year. And um, I bought uh, one of the ones I bought, which I was a huge fan of, was Borat, which has an incredibly long title that I'm not going to say, but I think, you know, Borat subsequent movie film is what it's more commonly known as. And uh, so first, did you see Borat? Did you see that one? I I will say I have not, but I will just say really quick, if you're watching this on YouTube, obviously we're going to have the list of nominees in the screen. They pop up at the beginning of each of these categories we're going to talk about. So if you're on the, if you're listening to the audio version, this is just going to be more kind of a free form discussion. We're just kind of bounce around and talk about the different nominees and all the different categories. So we won't kind of go through and list every single one, but if you're watching this again, you'll see them pop up on the screen so you can pause and kind of take a look at some of them if we don't touch on every single nominee in every category we mentioned. But Borat, I will say, I didn't see this sequel. I saw the original way back when, and I thought it was pretty, it was pretty funny. And 
I will say I am really psyched that this is an Academy Award nominee. This Borat sequel is nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, and the actress also nominated as well. But it just, I just get a kick out of this movie being nominated for an Academy Award. And you can debate whether or not that's because maybe last year was a little bit slow with movies and they just had to kind of lump this one in. Or maybe, you know, people thought, hey, this film deserves a chance to try to win this award. Well, I, I'm going to have to say it's the latter because the original was also nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. So I think the Academy appreciates what that character does. I mean, it's and it's adapted. A lot of people may not know that it's adapted because Borat comes from the original Dolly G show which was Sasha Baron's show that brought him to, to fame and prominence way back when. And, and, um, and uh, yeah, so the first movie had that nomination. And then this one came out. And I think a lot of people, you know, we've had a lot of diminishing sequels in the past few years. And it's something we've discussed a few times. And so when this came out, it was, I'd say it was as hilarious as the first one. And you had not just that, you had the scene that had everybody talking, which was the Rudy Giuliani scene. And that just was, became almost like a zeitgeist moment in, in, in pop culture. Um, just, just because of what it was and what it represented. And then you had um, Maria Bakalova who she came into the sequel and you're like, all right, it's a Borat movie. So they put in somebody else and she can't be possibly as good. But she was as good, if not better, than Sasha Baron Cohen in the movie. And that's why comedy, which barely gets recognized in, in, by the Academy, she's, she's pulled down an extremely rare, all comedic uh, uh, performance Academy Award nomination for supporting actress, which is phenomenal. Yeah, just really good for this movie. It, it, it kind of feels like the little movie that could, you know, standing up to some of these other ones that are in this category, these really heavy drama, well-acted, well-made movies. And then you have Borat up there. It's just, it's really great to see that kind of stand up there with these other ones. So really interesting to find out. I didn't know the original was nominated as well. So, you know, maybe you're right where this one kind of earned this nomination, this Borat subsequent movie film with this uh, screenplay nomination. Yeah. And it's like you said, you know, it's up against other, it's up against some pretty heavy topics in terms of this one's obviously an adapted, but it's up against the father, which is deals with, uh, you know, uh, dementia, nomad land, which was in your top, uh, top 10. It was, it's in my top 20. It was, didn't, didn't crack my top 10, but I did love the movie. I thought it was excellent. Um, which is a pretty serious movie about dealing with the, the death. And then one night in Miami, which was a great movie about, um, uh, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, Ma Malcolm X, Jim Brown, and uh, oh man, I can't think of the other guy's name. Uh, Sam something, and uh, and then the White Tiger, which I am not exactly sure what that is to be honest with you. Yeah, um, it's, but it's, like those are some heavy topics, man. And then you have Borat, and I I appreciate that the Academy was they nominate comedy comedy is so disrespected and i think a lot of times i think that's a common theme for the oscars and then borat comes and it gets some respect yeah i hope it's a, a trend that continues where these genres that are kind of looked down on by the academy awards are starting to be included more because we've talked in the past about actors and movies that haven't been nominated in the past that absolutely deserve to but they were in genres like comedy and horror and you know which are looked down on by the academy so hopefully this is trending upwards so you know you mentioned some of these other screenplay nominees obviously some of these deal with some heavy topics and that's a common trend for award nominated movies because they take a close look at things that we don't like talking about that really aren't everyday discussions such as dementia or homelessness and these other types of things and poverty that just you know, they really kind of take a deep dive into some of those topics. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially, yeah. I mean, I was looking at the original screenplay category, too. Those are all just heavy topics. Judas and the Black Messiah, Minari, Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal, Trial of Chicago 7. It's just heavy, heavy topics, man. And, and I think there was, a, I don't know, do you watch those Honest trailers? 
ever. Yeah, I do. I, I, you know what? I will say I usually like honest trailers. I didn't really like their honest trailer for this year's Oscars. I, something about it just kind of felt like they were just tearing apart these movies that were really great. And, you know, they just seemed kind of bitter and it, it didn't really strike me as, as funny as years past. I'll be honest. The only honest trailers I've ever watched was this year's Oscars. Cause I've, I've never watched them before. Cause it, that exact reason I always hear they're too snarky and too uppity. And so, but I was bored yesterday and I was like, I got five minutes and I watched it and I thought they were pretty funny, but it definitely took hold of the serious, like the weightiness of, of everything nominated this year. And it was like talking about how 2020 was already so weighty. And then all the movies nominated are like just depressing movies, really. Look, I mean, that's again, it's that's kind of what happens when you have these nominated movies because they're so well acted and directed and they deal with topics that are tough to talk about and make a beautiful movie out of them. So I will say if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll we'll link it down in the description, the honest trailer for this year's Oscars. But I would suggest going back and watching past honest trailers for other Oscars because I thought those were a little bit better in the past compared to this year. But, um, you know, so screenplays, you know, kind of getting back to the category here. Um, what what kind of stands out to you? What What is a kind of clear front runner or the one that you want slash think will win in either one or both of these categories? So adapted screenplay, I want I would definitely want Borat to win because I want Sasha Baron Cohen to be an Academy Award winner. I just like the guy. I believe it's going to go to Nomadland. Nomadland seems to be the front runner this year uh, in terms of adapted. And it, would you, since yeah. that was in your top 10, I would say you'd probably. Yeah. Nomadland was really great and it is adapted because it's kind of comes from the stories of the people in this movie. And I don't just say that like the movie that it's based on these people. There are actual people who live this kind of lifestyle that were in this movie that it's based on, that it's adapted from is, is their stories and a book as well, but it's still just, you know, I think it was really great and really brought that adaptation to life. And yeah, it certainly could be a front runner for sure. Yeah. Original screenplay. I want trial of the Chicago seven to win. I think it might take it actually as well. I think uh, I think Aaron Aaron Sorkin for me is is my favorite screenwriter. Uh, I, that guy is just phenomenal. I love everything that guy writes, and 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 I think I, I of those nominees, uh, potentially Minari could come in and swoop it up. But I think Trial of Chicago Seven is going to take that one. Yeah. So you know, I won't even offer a prediction at every single one of these, and unless I feel kind of strongly about one, if I think it will or should win, but. You know, certainly those are a couple of my kind of front runners. The heavy hitters is Minari and Trial of, of the Chicago 7 for original screenplay. So, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. I, I watch the Oscars every year, so I'll certainly tune in and see how the screenplay categories shape up this year. All right. So our next category we're going to talk about is the supporting actor category, which usually in the broadcast is the uh, first Oscar given. Because, you know, they try and give you a nice heavy hitter in the beginning before they go to like the, the uh, you know, sound design categories. But um, a solid lineup this year, a really solid lineup this year. Um, um, for me, I, uh, I was I saw Sound of Metal uh, a, long, a while ago when it first came out and the, the guy in it named Paul Racy was I saw that. And as soon as I finished it, I said. I hope that guy gets nominated. That guy was phenomenal in the movie. And then the precursor awards came out, Golden Globes and stuff, and he wasn't nominated. And I was like, dang, man, he's going he's gonna to miss out on his nomination. And then the Oscar nominations came, and boom, Paul Racy was, was there. So it was nice that he wasn't forgotten because he's not an actor that a lot of people know. I believe he was a stage actor, more, most prominent stage actor, and he is a uh, – He's a sign language expert. Um, he, his parents, I believe, are deaf. And so he is a big into sign language and, and um, uh, that he does a lot of that stuff with film and, and stuff. So um, have you seen Sound of Metal? Uh, Sound of Metal, I haven't covered yet. You know, again, there's so many movies that are nominated. It's hard to get to every single one of them before the Oscars because in the past, I've used the Oscars as a platform to figure out which movies I should, you know, put on my watch list, 
ones that are winning a lot of awards, ones that look interesting that I didn't realize actors were in. So Sound of Metal is the one I haven't gotten to yet. But of course, I will. It sounds interesting. But, you know, getting back to the category here, odds are somebody from Judas and the Black Messiah is going to win because you have, if I'm pronouncing their names right, so don't hold me to it, but Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield are both nominated from that movie. And both are phenomenal actors. You've certainly seen them in other things. You know, if those names don't exactly ring a bell because they're not names like Brad Pitt or Tom Hanks, but, you know, you've certainly seen them in other things. And Sasha Baron Cohen, he wasn't nominated for Borat, but he was nominated for another movie this year. So he still has a shot of winning an Oscar, which is great. You know, two movies in the same year that have kind of from him that are up there for nominations. So it certainly is another interesting category for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, I can tell you uh, enjoy some alcohol because his name's Daniel Kaluuya, not Daniel Kalua. Gotcha. <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> uh, but um, so that's an interesting thing because a lot of people had a discussion about how Lake Keith Stanfield in the film is more of the lead. I mean, he is the Judas the Black Messiah being Daniel Kaluuya's character, who um, the, the head of the Black Panther Party, um, who was also featured in uh, Trial of Chicago Seven as a role in that film, the the character of the, the um, of the man, um, and so right now Daniel Kaluuya is, I, I'd say he's going to win. I'd say he's a he's won every precursor award so far. He is the front runner. However. Some people believe that because Lake Keith Stanfield is nominated with Kaluuya, they could split the votes, which would allow Leslie Odom Jr., I think, is the one who a lot of people think could slide in and win for, um, he played, I can't remember the name, but he played Sam something in uh, One Night in Miami, which was a phenomenal performance. Yeah, I certainly hope Daniel Kaluuya wins. You know, he certainly deserves it. And he's a great actor. He's been in a number of other things as well over the years. Really diverse kind of portfolio that he has in terms of other things that he's been in, other projects. So I hope it goes to him. I like Daniel Kaluuya. And I, what I, I like that he... I've only really seen him in intense roles. You know, I mean, Get Out is an intense role. Uh, even Black Panther, it's an intense role. And so Judas and Black Messiah, an extremely intense role. So last week, I don't know if you watched, you know, Saturday Night Live. I like seeing him host Saturday Night Live. It was nice to see this 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 tremendous, serious actor take on some comedy, which you don't, you know, it, it's like, all right, that guy, that guy's not really, that guy can do it all. So, you know. I wouldn't mind seeing Kaluuya take on a comedic movie as well, because he was pretty solid on SNL. I think eventually he'll be due for one. You know, that seems to be a trend where actors that have a lot of serious roles, eventually they do a comedy and it hits harder because these serious actors who eventually star in a comedy, people are used to them being so serious. So I think eventually you're going to see him in a good comedy and it's going to have a little bit more punch because, again, he's a more serious actor and you don't really see him goofing around as much. So I think one day we will get a comedy star in him. Yeah, agreed. All right, so we're going to take the next one. We're going to continue the supporting roles with supporting actress. And uh, this one you have, uh, it's another solid lineup. Um, Amanda Seyfried, who I am a huge fan of, getting back, you know, all the way back to Mean Girls. And it's nice to see those actresses, you know, Rachel McAdams, Amanda Seyfried, and uh, they're all getting, you know, they 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 get their Oscar nominations for for taking on some 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 more serious roles. Um, Olivia Coleman, who recently won for um, uh, the, the 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 favorite, and then you got obviously we already talked about Maria Bakalova with Borat. I would love to see her win. Not going to happen. I think the nomination in of itself is is her victory there. But this one is actually a. Uh, I wasn't expecting it to be kind of as as closed up as it is. But it seems like Yu Jung Yu Yu Jung Yoon from Minari. She's been winning a lot of the precursor awards, so it seems like it could go to her. However, Glenn Close is nominated. And so Glenn Close, even though Hillbilly Elegy, I wasn't a fan of the movie very much. It was okay. It just, you know, it wasn't that it was okay. 
but Glenn Close has been nominated a record number of times. And she's like one of those actresses who you're like, she doesn't have an Oscar. And so I think this year could potentially be the year that they're like, let's give Glenn Close the Oscar. So this best supporting actress category certainly is interesting in the way that there are some different kind of people represented and Glenn Close could certainly get her due in terms of finally winning an Oscar. So um, I think it's interesting that Amanda Seyfried is nominated because she isn't somebody who I normally think is an Oscar nominated actress, but good for her kind of this different person that's nominated in, the, in this category. And I'm not even going to take a shot at the name because I know I'm going to butcher it, but the actress from Minari, obviously she was really great as well. And you always like to see it given to not given, but people winning who deserve it that are from a different background and we're in a, a different kind of movie featuring people of a different race or creed or religion or just whatever it may be people who are a little bit outside the norm of what you usually see. So this is again, a pretty diverse, pretty interesting category. So this one, uh, yeah, I, I could see it going to a few different people who are nominated. Yeah. And with the lady from Minari, um, she, she, she is pretty funny in that movie. Like it's, and it's, she she gets to take on you know her character has has an arc in that film it's not just she's not just a kooky grandmother although she gets to play that in the beginning and then something happens to her in the film and she, her character kind of takes a, a 180 and i think that's that's where you see the the respect of that performance come in which is because she nails the comedy you know and then she nails that 180 performance and everything and so I, I mean, I, I, and her her speeches. I don't know if you watched the Baftas the other day, but she gave a hilarious speech at the Baftas. And so, a lot of times, they do say this is like, if you give a good speech, like good, funny speech in the precursor awards, it helps people like Oscar voters take notice of you to where they're like, oh, we like we like this person. Let we're going to vote for her. Yeah, and I will say, just a quick side note, we didn't really kind of mention it up top, but obviously these are movies that just came out that people hadn't even heard of until these Oscar nominations. So this is spoiler-free. We're not going to get into spoilers for any of these movies. We're still just going to talk about them what we can in terms of them relating to these different categories. So no no spoilers here at all. But I think you're right because, you know, I really loved, again, I'm not going to tr- take an attempt at his name because I'm going to butcher it, but the director of Parasite his accept- acceptance speeches were just hilarious and he just seemed like a fun guy to hang around with. So I always get a kick out of people whose acceptance speeches are like that instead of the templated, I'd like to thank this person, this person, and this person, blah, blah, blah. So I, it's certainly interesting and I, I hope she wins so I can hear another good acceptance speech. You're 100% right about it. It's Bong Joon-ho who directed Parasite and he do- his speech was so good because I remember it because he said, he said, if you can get over the one inch subtitles on your screen, you open a world of entertainment. And I was just like, that's such a, such a genius way of phrasing it. Just get over the one inch on the bottom of your screen and you will open your world, a whole, whole nother uh, a culture essentially of different, different movies from other countries. All right, so the next category we're going to go is the lead actor category. Um, so, again, great nom. I mean, I don't think we're telling tales when we say great nominees. They're Oscar nominated. They're all going to be great nominees. And this one, you know, you got uh, your Sound of Metal, Riz Ahmed, we discussed a little bit. You got Chadwick Boseman, Ma Rainey, Anthony Hopkins, the father, Gary Oldman, Mank, and Stephen Yoon from Minari. Or if you're familiar with The Walking Dead, he was... He was uh, Glenn, I believe, on The Walking Dead. And um, great category. This one for me was um, was such a toss-up. So I, I actually uh, am a member of SAG after, and we get the vote and, and, and the SAG Awards. And this one, I was I was torn on who I'm going to vote, who I voted for, because Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey was phenomenal. The guy has been great, and this was his kind of last chance. He obviously passed away, unfortunately. This is going to be his last chance to be Academy Award winner, Chadwick Boseman. But Anthony Hopkins in The Father gave one of the top performances I've ever seen. And so I was really torn on 
who do I vote for? Because I want Chadwick Boseman to be an Oscar winner. Anthony Hopkins is obviously already an Oscar winner for uh, uh, Silence of the Lambs. But ultimately, I did vote for Anthony Hopkins because I, I it's a top top six performance all time for me. It's hilarious. It's, it's heartbreaking. It is phenomenal. Yeah, this one is a tough category for me, too, because with one winner means all the other people in this category have to lose. And for me, that really sucks because I think the actors in this category and the roles and the nominations that they got for what they did, it's a shame that there have to be so many losers that only one person can win because Riz Ahmed, uh, Sound of Metal, Chadwick Boseman, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Anthony Hopkins, The Father... And, and the other ones as well. It's just like, it's so tough to pick a winner out of this category for me. It's just so many great, varied movies in this and so many great performances. And it's a shame that, again, there has to be a loser. I certainly hope Chadwick um, wins as well. And not just because, again, he tragically kind of passed on, but he certainly deserves it. And it would certainly be a great addition to his legacy to have that as well. But again, Anthony Hopkins, great performance as well as the other ones. It's just, for me, this is just going to be tough to watch in terms of the the losers. But again, I'm going to be happy for whoever wins for sure. I think so. Yeah. I, I, I if, if Anthony Hopkins or Chadwick, if any of them went, obviously, because I, I'd love them all. I think they're all phenomenal actors, but Chadwick, Bo- this is a category between I mean, Bozeman and Hopkins. Hopkins took the BAFTA, uh, but Chadwick Boseman has been taking most of the other precursor awards. And that's another one where speeches have come down. His wife has been giving um, the acceptance speeches for him. And her speeches have been phenomenal. They have been so good. And and I, I, I think I think we are going to see – there's only been a, a couple of posthumous uh, Academy Award winners, such as Heath Ledger um, and the guy from Network, whose name escapes me. Um, so I do think Bozeman is going to take it, but I will not be upset if if Hopkins takes it because, again, one of the best performances I've ever seen. Yeah, this is one where I don't think there's really going to be a big surprise no matter who wins because it's certainly going to be earned and it's certainly these are larger than life roles from these past from this past year. And I don't think it's really going to be a surprise no matter who wins, but those are a couple that certainly seem to be the front runners and the big names and the favorites for who might win this award. So now we've come to lead actress, and this is actually one of the most wide open categories of uh, this season. Usually the precursor awards tend to go to a single person that kind of lets you know who's going to take it on Oscar night. This year, however, we've seen most of the big precursor awards go to uh, every single one of these people, Carrie Mulligan has won. Uh, Vanessa Vanessa Kirby did not win yet, but um, phenomenal performance in Pieces of a Woman. But Frances McDormand won the BAFTA. Andrew Day won the uh, Golden Globe. Viola Davis won um, the SAG Award. So you're seeing uh, the love spread, if you will, in terms of who wins, and and it's making predicting this category extremely tough. For my money, Carrie Mulligan, Promising Young Woman. 100% deserves this Oscar. She was phenomenal in that movie. Yeah, again, this is a this is a tough one. It sounds like this will be even more of a toss up than the male lead actor category, lead actress. It sounds like it, anybody could it could be anybody. So, and deservedly so, a number of good actresses and a number of good roles and very varied roles from film to film when you look at some of these and yeah, I, I'm going to agree with you. For my money, I certainly hope But I'm not sure that Carrie Mulligan will win for Promising Young Woman because, excuse me, when I first saw this movie, her performance blew me away. Just the amount of depth that she had when she was playing her character, um, you know, how she was able to go from scene to scene and all the attention would be on her character. You just didn't know what she was going to do next if she was acting in the movie if her character was kind of acting if she was playing along or if she had this other plan or just anything like that it was just a super great performance and you know i kind of went through my top 10 movies and for my money in my eyes this is the best female performance from the past year's worth of movies yeah i uh 100 agree and i and i think the biggest competition 
actually even hard to say because they're all big com- because they've all won an award. You're like, they're all big competition. And Francis McDormand could potentially a lot of times, you know, the Academy can be like, she's won two already. Let's let's give somebody else the Oscar. Um, and a lot of times that tends to go to somebody like an Andre Day or Andre Day for the United States versus Billie Holiday, who is a new, she's a famous singer. She sings that song Rise Up, which you hear in every commercial ever made. And, I, and um, but she's a new actress, but she's a new actress who came out and like is nominated, gave a phenomenal performance playing the true life Billie Holiday. A lot of times the Academy likes to reward that stuff. And uh, and Viola Davis is just you know she's Viola Davis you know you can't you can't say really a bad word about Viola Davis so it, it's an open category. Yeah, I will say a personal shout out for me for Frances McDormand who when I saw Nomadland, I mean she didn't really seem like she was acting. She just seemed like you took somebody from off the street who was her character and and put her in the movie. She didn't even seem like she was acting. She was just she was the role. So. She was also phenomenal as well. And you said it, Viola Davis, phenomenal actress, as well as the other nominees. So again, tough competition for sure. And deservedly so given the high prestige of the Oscars. Yeah. And I will say Vanessa Kirby is, uh, I think a lot of people in terms of movies, like a lot of people know her from the crown, but in terms of movies, she's kind of become like a big action star. She was in the Mission Impossible film. She was in Hobbs and Shaw. So it was nice seeing her in this movie, which is about a woman dealing with a uh, a, uh, a, uh, a stillbirth or the death of a child at birth. And it's a very intense movie. And, and it really, the whole movie relies on her performance and, and the weight that she's going through in the aftermath of this horrible tragedy. So again, a weighty film but phenomenal. All right. So moving along, we're going to get into the best director category. And uh, again, a pretty solid list of people, you know, you have uh, two women nominated in the same year, which I don't believe has ever happened before. Uh, Chloe Zhao for Nomadland and Emerald Fennell for a promising young woman. Phenomenal. Um, Then you have Lee Isaac Chung from Minari. You have David Fincher, who's one of those guys you're like, he should have an Oscar but he doesn't. And so you're like, all right, man, is this his year? And then you have Thomas Vinterberg for another round. And um, right now the precursor categories pretty much have Chloe Zhao taking this Oscar um, for Nomad Land, which uh, I did watch again the other day for a second time, second time watching it. And it is a very phenomenally directed movie. And I remember when I watched it the first time I finished and I was like, you know what? This makes me excited for the Eternals because she's the director of the Marvel film, the Eternals. And I was like, if she could take a movie like Nomadland and make me like not look away from the screen, I'm looking forward to the Eternals, which is a, is a Marvel property. I know nothing about. So obviously you like Nomadland promising young woman because I made your top 10 and stuff. So what do you think about this? All right. So a a lot to unpack there. So, um, look, okay. In terms of, uh, best director, certainly a lot of talented ones here. And it certainly is good to see that female representation this year. I think something that's been sorely lacking in years past. And while I don't think it should automatically go to a female director, I think it should go to somebody based on the merits of their film. I certainly think the two female candidates could be front runners for this category for best director. Uh, Chloe Zhao, who directed Nomadland, uh, just a beautiful, very well-acted, well-directed film when you talk about pertaining to this category. So I certainly could see that winning, and deservedly so. Um, the direction that she was giving the actors and actresses you know, was great, and obviously, like I said, very beautiful-looking film as well. But you know, Promising Young Woman, very tightly directed as well, and certainly... You know, David Fincher, it, it's a shame he hasn't won an Oscar yet, and I don't think this is going to be his year again either. But, yeah, he's one of my favorite living directors. I really wish he would win, but I don't think it's going to happen this year. So um, about the Marvel part of that, we'll see what happens because I've seen Marvel movies in the past that have had good directors attached to them. But because it's Marvel, and to me it, it kind of seems like they make their movies by template, it doesn't really seem like they really give their directors a ton of room to really express themselves. 
uh, with Doctor Strange, I wasn't really seeing a ton of Scott Derrickson behind that. So we'll see if if her style, if she's allowed to, you know, kind of push the boundaries a little bit and what she can do with the Eternals. But I'm a little bit skeptical about that part. Yeah, well, we'll see about the Eternals. I mean, I, I haven't been, a, I haven't, the Marvel movie hasn't really let me down too much yet. But in terms of directing, so I, I was, I was all on board. I really wanted Fincher to win. I don't think he is. I think Chloe Zhao is going to wrap it up. But then earlier this week, I did watch another round, which is the Thomas Vinterberg movie. And this is where the Oscar nominations come into play. This is a movie I probably would have not watched had I not seen it nominated and not been and been like, who is Thomas Vinterberg? It's a it's a film from Denmark. So it's a foreign film from Denmark, which stars Mad Mickelson, Mads Mickelson, who I'm sure you know from uh, Hannibal and, and other uh, shows and movies where he usually plays a villain. But this movie had such an interesting concept. It's about um, some philosopher says that at birth we're born with a 0.05 deficiency of a blood alcohol content level. So the film is about this group of teachers who decide to keep a blood alcohol content level 0.5% or 0.05%. And I, I won't give any spoilers, but I will say the ending of this film is one of the best endings I have ever seen in my life. And it is one of the most earned endings I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it is... It, the music that plays is phenomenal. Mads Mikkelsen gives a performance that, from my money, Mads Mikkelsen should have been nominated for Best Actor. Um, it, it is a phenomenal performance. And and, uh, and Mr. Vinterberg, who directed this, he unfortunately, he, had a, uh, he suffered a, a tragedy at the start of this film. His daughter uh, actually passed away uh, four days into shooting this movie. And so you get the feeling with this movie that there's so much more to it. Like he poured his heart and soul and the grief and everything he was going in, going on with him into this film. And you can tell from the direction of it, the performers, the performances in it, you can tell that they were like, they gave it 150% for this, for this director. And so I, I will say before, because, you know, that it was a, a lot there. So I, I just wanted to talk about really quick, you know, you, you hate to see an actor miss out on a nomination, especially in a year where we didn't have as many movies as years past come out. So I certainly believe Mad, Mads Mikkelsen deserved a nomination for this movie. He is a phenomenal actor and you've definitely seen him in a lot of different things if that name doesn't sound familiar. But you know, again, uh, you hate to hear about this, too, with a tragedy associated with this film, but hopefully it lives on as a legacy to the people that are gone and we can remember them through pieces of art like this, where, you know, the director poured his his heart and soul into it. And hopefully that's a good tribute to the people that he lost. So, again, it's good to see exposure for a foreign film like this making the cut. And this is a film that I had not heard of until the nominations either. So, again, People sometimes use the Oscars as a platform to look at these movies that they may not have known about or they had heard of, but don't really know the quality yet. So again, this is kind of one that was introduced to me like that, where I had sort of heard of it, but didn't really know much about it. So the Oscars almost kind of serve sometimes as a checklist for people who want to make a list of movies to go back and watch that were really great from the past year and kind of check some of these out that are winning all the awards. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And, uh, you know, we'll see who takes it on Oscar night, but I think as of right now, Chloe Zhao is as close to a lock as we're going to get. We'll have to wait and see. That's certainly whoever wins again. It's going to be a shame that the other category, the other people nominated in this category have to lose, but certainly whoever wins it will definitely deserve it for sure. All right, so the big category of the night, obviously, is Best Picture. And again, we are in a, a wide open territory in terms of what's actually going to take the award. Uh, front runner right now is Nomadland. That has been taking a lot of the precursor awards. Um, I won't be mad if Nomadland wins. Really, I won't be mad if any of these movies win. They're all great movies. Personal preference, Trial of Chicago 7. Obviously, at the top of this episode, that was my favorite movie of last year. So how, how, how are you going on these? 
Yeah, again, I'm not going to be disappointed if any one of these win either. I don't really think there's one up there that maybe doesn't exactly deserve to win, as we've had in years past where there have been controversial winners like Green Book and The Shape of Water, where there were people argued that there were better movies and like contending against some of those that should have won. But um, I will say I won't be disappointed no matter what wins and you know, again, this is a this is a toss up. It, it could go to any one of these. And if you don't really watch any of the any of the award shows that come before the Oscars, you don't really know. It's even more of a surprise who's going to win. But again, it seems like maybe based on these other award shows that have come before that there may be a discrepancy in terms of this person's the favorite, but it's really this person. So, you know, it, any of these movies for me, I would certainly see winning and I would certainly enjoy seeing them winning because a lot of these were such great movies. Yeah. 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 In terms of green book, that was my favorite movie of that year. So I was extremely happy to see that one take best picture. I know there was some, some stuff going on where people just called it a uh, driving Miss Daisy part two, but I loved green book. Uh, and, 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 you know, yeah, in terms of this year, I think the big thing was like, the top grossing movie nominated this year only made $6 million um, theatrically, which obviously isn't a lot. Um, I think had trial of Chicago seven been theatrically released, which was the original intention. It was supposed to be a big paramount uh, October, October, September, October release, but obviously coronavirus, uh, they wanted to get the film out um, before the election. And so they sold it off to Netflix where at it's done very well on Netflix, but I think had trial of Chicago seven hit a theatrical release, it would have been a pretty, uh, I think it would have been a substantial hit theatrically. And, yeah, uh, it's, yeah. um, it's, it's always a question mark because when you get Oscar nominated movies, they don't rake in the box office dollars because they're not something that's really wide appealing or something that someone can just go to the movies and turn their brain off for two hours. A lot of the times these best picture nominated movies are dramas or they're about heavy subject material. So it's always a question mark, you know, if we weren't living in a pandemic right now, how much money some of these movies would have made at the box office. And it would have been interesting to see which ones made more than others for sure. But, you know, I will say kind of touching on that a little bit too, with all these movies have kind of come out during the pandemic, they were released around that time, give or take, you know, months or whenever they came out. But I'm still really surprised this year about the quality of films that we still got that were released. And granted, they were probably filmed probably before the pandemic. But again, I wasn't really expecting that many movies of quality or that many in general to be released during the pandemic. You know, these times where we weren't getting that many new release movies in theaters because theaters weren't open and movies just kept getting pushed back. So I will say I was really pleasantly surprised seeing this many quality movies come out in this tough time where movies had a lot of trouble showing up and had a lot of trouble of getting people to, to notice them for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and I think that therein lies kind of the genius of Borat because Borat originally started before the pandemic and, and, you know, it was just, there's going to be a sequel to Borat and touch on the, you know, the political climate going on now. And then the coronavirus hit and you see it in the film, the coronavirus hits and he goes and stays with those two guys during the coronavirus. And so the film kind of became a, a coronavirus movie, almost the impossible, which was doing an improv movie in the middle of a pan, a, an unprecedented pandemic being hilarious. I mean, it just, it checks all those boxes. It wasn't nominated for best picture, but it just, if you were to stick a lightning rod of film in terms of a 2020 film that represents what 2020 was, I think Borat subsequent movie film is kind of that film. I think that's certainly a very good way of putting it, that it just kind of encapsulates this year that we've had and all the craziness that's come with it. But so getting back to the Best Picture nominees, what is your favorite slash who do you think will win? You know, what movie kind of stands out to you among this list? So favorite, Trial of Chicago 7. I, I want Trial of Chicago 7 to win. I think it's phenomenal. Aaron Sorkin, written and directed, only his second movie that he's directed um, after Molly's Game, which was one of my favorites from that year. Going to win, 
Nomad Land, I think, is going to take it. Yeah, I could certainly see that for sure. Nomad Land is kind of like a piece of art, and it's really well acted. And we've we've talked about it a little bit uh, during this episode, but it's so well acted. It's it's beautifully shot, directed. The story that it tells, it doesn't hit you over the head by giving you an easy explanation by saying A to B. This is what happens. You know, it kind of lets you interpret things for yourself, but still kind of leads you there at the same time. Still kind of holds your hand a little bit, but not too much. And it just, it's a really good movie. There's no two ways about it. It just, it's a really unique and, and beautiful experience, even if there is some tragedy and some sadness behind it. But to tell a good story, you need a couple of different emotions behind it. So Nomadland, I can certainly see winning. I hope, because again, it was one of my favorites of the year and I enjoyed every second of it will win is Promising Young Woman. I really love that movie. I love Carrie Mulligan's performance in it. I love what it was trying to say. I think it was a nice straightforward, but still had twists and turns movie and really good performances. So I hope it's Promising Young Woman. So Promising Young Woman, I I agree. I absolutely love Promising Young Woman. And that was one where the trailers almost sold it as like a horror revenge movie. The trailers were like, this woman takes guys home and, and, and kills them or something. And then you watch the movie and it has the actual story of the film is way deeper, more complex than the trailers let on. And, yeah. It's, eh. it's something you really hate to see is when a studio or company, whoever's behind it botches the marketing campaign for a movie and they really misrepresent it and what it, what you're going to see in the movie. And I did cause I had known about promising young woman before I saw it. But I, ha- but I hadn't watched any of the trailers. So I went back and watched the trailers and a couple advertising clips, you know, talk show interviews and that sort before the movie had come out. And the trailers just, they don't do it justice. They paint a totally different movie than what you get. So I would almost say if you want to watch Promising Young Woman, don't go back and watch trailers. Just read the synopsis. Just a, a, a quick two second summary of what the movie's about, a couple lines of text. If that interests you, then watch it. But do yourself a favor and don't watch the trailers because this is one of those cases to me where they really misrepresented the movie and what it was supposed to present to the audience. Yeah, yeah, I 100% agree. But it'll be interesting. It's a no, wide open race this year for uh, many of the categories. And that. Uh, you know, the winds are leaning one way, but come Oscar night, anything can happen. So I will say, are you looking forward to watching the Oscars more this year, less? You know, is this a tradition where you do? Because I know you're very, you have your calendar of things you like to do on certain days. Do you have an Oscar tradition that you usually do? Do you dress up in a uh, tuxedo at home, you know, to sit on the couch and watch? So, you know, what what's this year's Oscars going to be like for you? Uh, yeah, no, I, I have not missed an Oscars, uh, I, I want to say since birth. Uh, I, I tell people flat out, I look forward to the Oscars more than I look forward to the Super Bowl, unless like the 49ers or Chiefs are playing in the Super Bowl. Um, but the Oscar night for me, award season as a whole, I have just always loved. I, I've always loved award season. So tradition wise, um, you know, it's usually just an excuse for me to eat. Uh, as you, most of my traditions are food based. And so, you know, I tend, I tend to, uh, you know, Oscar night, I'll have like a nice surf and turf, you know, get myself a nice lobster tail and a steak. And that's kind of, you know, how I celebrate the Oscars, you know, um, in years past, I've had Oscar parties. Um, you know, people come over, I do, I do the, uh, I do the, uh, the sheet, you know, I give everybody a sheet and we fill it out and see who wins. Uh, until last year, I was undefeated. However, last year, I don't count because I feel like the guy cheated. But, um, yeah. but uh, you know, yeah, I do the sheet. I enjoy that type of stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, I, Oscar season, Oscar night for me is like, don't nobody text me, nobody bother me. I'm watching the Oscars. And meanwhile, I'll be watching and I'll be blowing up your phone saying, you know, what you think of that? Oh, my God, I couldn't believe that. So... I will say I watch the Oscars now every year too, but that didn't always used to be the case for me. I had liked movies for a long time, ever since I was a kid. And I know a lot of people say that, that that they like movies, but 
I really liked watching movies and kind of dissecting them in my own way. And But I hadn't really watched the Oscars until maybe kind of halfway through college when I started tuning in because I thought they were maybe boring or that the awards were going to the wrong movies. But I do still enjoy watching every year and watching them get it right when they do, when they nominate and people who deserve win awards. So I really do enjoy that part of it. And I enjoy watching the ceremony and the grandeur and all these great movies getting the spotlight. So I'll definitely be tuning in as well. And I certainly will enjoy this year's Oscars, even though it may, of course, look a little bit different than years past because of everything going on these days. Yeah, this year's production is going to be produced. It's uh, one of the producers, Steven Soderbergh. So I'll be interested in what Soderbergh brings to it in terms of how he produces it. And they're, they're going host free again. I think that's a mistake. I, I like an Oscar host. I like a comedian coming out, giving funny jokes and stuff, and then leading into the awards host free. I'm not a huge fan of. Yeah, I, I think I'm with you where I think a host is a good way to kind of tie the whole show together, have them tie different segments together, have a good opening monologue full of relevant jokes from the past year. So I'm a little disappointed that it's not going to be a central host this year as well. And again, you could kind of pin that on the crazy times that we're going through right now, where maybe they wanted to try a little bit of a different format and not have a host given the, the ceremony specifics this year. But I will say going forward, I hope they add a host back in because again, I think it's a good thread connecting all the different segments that they're kind of running the show and doing some funny or interesting stuff. So I hope going forward, they go back to having a host. Thank you to everybody for tuning in on this 2021 Oscars edition of Life Imitating Movies weekly podcast where myself, Mitch, and my co-host Brad, this edition, this episode, we're talking about all these different Oscar-nominated features, movies, directors, actors, actresses, and like everyone else, we just enjoy speculating about who's going to win, who deserved to be nominated, some ones that got snubbed. So hopefully this has been an interesting discussion for the viewers, the listeners, and Maybe it gets other people talking as well. Maybe introduce some movies that you hadn't heard of yet because they were nominated. And like myself, you use the Oscars as a platform to decide what movies you want to put on your watch list in the near future. So I'm certainly going to enjoy tuning into the Oscars. This episode is going to air on the Monday before the Oscars. So you have a good six days to watch, listen to this, and speculate away during the week with your coworkers, friends, family, whoever you like discussing movies with. And hopefully we've, you know, kind of upped that discussion factor a little bit. We've provided some good, meaningful insight for you. So thank you everybody for tuning in. And next week we're going to stick with the Oscars. Uh, the episode is going to air Monday after the Oscars. So a day after, and we're going to be talking about winners from past ceremonies and some of our pa favorite picks in each of those categories. So it's going to be another great, interesting show from the stuff that we've done so far so hopefully you can tune in for that as well and just we want to say again thank you for tuning into this special oscars edition of life imitating movies yeah man and if you're watching this video feel free to throw some comments down there on the thing about what you think might win if you're if you want to feel so inclined or if you're listening to this on itunes head on over to youtube and type in life imitating movies and uh pull it pull it you know start a conversation i think we both checked the page so you know i wouldn't mind talking to some people out there who who uh share similar interests absolutely you gotta you gotta do the plug you gotta do the hey do all the youtube things like comment subscribe so you know but we'd be more than up for having a discussion with whoever's listened to this so hopefully everyone's enjoyed this episode we'll be back again with the next episode with again an interesting oscars discussion from past winners focusing on them so thank you to everybody for tuning in and we'll be back again next week with a new episode